One of the more unusual images that the Ajahns use for describing the practice is that you're cooking your mind. It's like cooking rice. Uncooked rice can still grow, turn it into rice plants. If your mind is thoroughly cooked, it's not going to give rise to any more rice plants. It's not going to be reborn again. It's not going to have the craving that would lead to more becoming. So you're cooking your cravings. Now, as with all cooking, some of the main principles are the same for everybody. You're applying heat. That's the, the effort. But some people are like eggs. Some people are like vegetables. Other people are like meat. They cook at different temperatures. And the way they change as they go through the cooking will have different stages for each. This is why it's important not to have too many set ideas about how the path is going to go. If you read him in a John whose mind was like Brussels sprouts, but your mind is like fish. You try to cook the fish the same way you cook Brussels sprouts, it doesn't quite work. So you read about the Ajans, you read about people who've been practicing the path and how they've gotten results. And as John Mahabhu says, you read this in order to gain confidence, and human beings can do this. But you don't want to try too hard to mold your mind so you have the same results and the same stages that they do. You focus on applying the heat right now. Now the heat is the heat of your effort. And John Lee has a nice image. He says it's like putting a hunk of rock into a smelter. You apply the heat, and the things that you wanted to get out of the rock will come out when you reach the melting point. If you try to go in with a little pick, saying, get the gold flakes out of the rock, or the little bits of tin, or the little bits of silver, that's not going to work. But you've applied the heat properly. Okay, when you reach the melting point for tin, here comes the tin. When you reach the melting point for gold, the gold comes out. So you focus on the causes. And then don't try too hard to squeeze things in the direction where you think they have to go. As with concentration, the way you relate to your breath is going to be different from the way anybody else relates to his or her breath. And you read about all these wonderful stages that people can get into the concentration, and you look at yours and it doesn't seem all that wonderful, so you toss it away, which is a mistake. You've got to work with what you've got. And if your concentration is just nice, okay, maintain nice concentration. If it's just okay, well, maintain okay. The whole point about concentration is you maintain it. Only if it's maintained does it begin to develop. Does it go through its various stages? So if the mind is with the breath, that's good enough. Just keep it there. And then over time you begin to have a sense, oh, I'm putting too much pressure on it, okay? Lessen, lessen the pressure a little bit. My focus is too narrow, okay? We'll widen it up a little bit. And then sit with that for a while. See what kind of results you're getting. You may decide that you made a mistake. Well, just go back to where you were before. Try not to get yourself tied up in knots about how long this is taking or what kind of a meditator you are. It's just awareness and the breath. Try to keep it at that level. And then begin to gain a sense of how it feels over time. And Paul Poot had a Dharma talk I listened to one time. He told about what it was like to stay with the Jansau. 
And John Tsai would give meditation instructions, and the people would ask, well, when I follow your instructions, what should I expect? And he says, just follow the instructions. Because if you focus on what you expect, you're not going to be following the instructions. You're going to focus on the expe expectations. Results don't come from expectations. They come from very ordinary things. Being aware of the breath, trying to be aware of the breath as continually as you can. No, he didn't add those explanations. His way of saying that if they ask, what should I expect, he would just say, don't ask, just do it. In a lot of ways, John Fuang was the same sort of teacher. This, this is the next step, and then you just do the next step. And then if something seems to be happening in your mind, and if it happens twice, then you can talk to him about it. It was interesting. If it happened just once, he wasn't interested. But he found something happened twice, that's a sign, okay, you're beginning to get someplace. And then he'd report it, and then he would say either change or keep on doing what you're doing. And there was no clear idea of where this was all supposed to go, aside from the fact that you just kept at the causes. And if your mind felt dull, okay, that was a sign you weren't doing it quite right. Or so if you went and complained to him with every little problem, he chased you away. He'd ask you to try to give it some thought. What do you think might work? Try to come up with a solution on your own. Run that past him. He would be interested. He would be willing to talk about that. In other words, you have to take some responsibility for your own practice. And you might say, how can I do that because I don't know what I'm doing? Well, look at what you are doing. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Put that aside for the time being. Just say, what are you doing right now? What do you think would work to get the mind to settle down? You try some of the things you've learned that you've heard about or you've read in books. But when you try it, you really try it. In other words, give it some time. Because on the one hand, we are creating a state of concentration here, but we're doing it in the dark. Unfortunately, it's not totally creation. that You're tuning into things that are already there and just letting them develop as you stay steadily with them. So it's not out of whole cloth. You tune into the, the way the breath feels in the body. This dimension of your awareness, which is already there, it's just you learn how to stay there. And as the mind is allowed to stay, it'll start developing in different ways. That sense of rapture may come, and rapture here can be all kinds of different things. If you, when you hear the word rapture, think of Saint Teresa going into ecstasies. That could get in the way of your practice, because for some people, rapture is just simply a sense of refreshment, ease, a sense of fullness, like all the blood vessels in the body seem to be nicely full, and nothing is tense. For other people, it is more intense. But you don't know beforehand what your rapture is going to be like. And in some cases, once you finally realize, oh, this is what he's talking about, it wasn't quite what you thought ahead of time. That's another one of the reasons why you don't want to have things mapped out too much in advance, because the map is going to correspond to your preconceived notions. It's like going to a foreign city. You can read about it in guidebooks and paint a picture in your head about what it's going to be like. When you actually get there, it's going to be something else. Now, if you're holding on too closely to those pictures and say, this can't be that city, I imagine it's some other way. It must be some other city someplace else. That's the real city. This is the wrong city.
Now, traveling to a foreign city, that's obviously pretty dumb. But that's the way a lot of us approach the concentration. We think it's got to be this way, it's got to be that way, and we have this definite idea in our heads. And nothing seems to quite match it, so you never find concentration because it doesn't correspond to what you imagined out of the books. But if you just do the instructions and find that after all, your mind is settling down. It doesn't seem anything remarkable yet, but at least it's staying here. Okay? Maintain that. That's how things begin. When they talk about the different stages of concentration, and there being momentary concentration, and then access concentration, and then finally fixed penetration. They're not radically different. It's just that the momentary concentration gets stitched together, so it begins to get deeper and deeper and deeper. Fixed penetration comes from momentary concentration. So don't throw away the concentration you've got. Learn how to nurture it. Learn how to protect it. And then when you start hitting right concentration, you'll probably hit it before you realize. But you begin to notice the mind seems more solid. It seems more settled. You come out of the concentration, you feel refreshed. Okay, that's a good sign. You have to learn by feeling your way. And the advantage of this is you're paying very close attention to what you're doing right here. And you're not constantly comparing it with some idea you've picked up someplace else. This is Zen Master Dogen, who had an interesting point. He said that the development of the path is no different from the realization of cessation. That doesn't mean that the path and the goal are the same thing. It means what it means is the activity of developing the path. If you pay careful attention to what you're doing, you'll find cessation in there. You don't have to look anywhere else. Which is why some of the Johns say that the breath itself is the path. Whatever your concentration object is, that's your path. That's what you follow. And if the mind is allowed to follow consistently enough, it's going to start doing the changes it has to do. So feel your way into the concentration. And try to be like a person who can't see, but has very sensitive fingers. The more you depend on your fingers, the more you realize that they can pick up things you wouldn't have known otherwise, that you could sense through the fingers. And that way you arrive at something real, not something that you jerry together beforehand in your mind. To go back to the original analogy, you're keeping the heat at just the right level. And you're stirring when you have to stir, and you're turning things over when you have to turn them over. And that way your mind gets thoroughly cooked.